Jane Gazzo presents Joe Roberts from Holocene. Well, it's an absolute pleasure to welcome to Sound as Ever, Joe Roberts of Holocene. Hello, Joe. Hello, Jane. How are you? Well, I'm excited because Holocene are reforming for the first time in what must be 20, 25 years since you called it Way a day. Way too long. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> we've, done, we've done a couple of quiet things along the way, you know, a couple of birthdays and that sort of thing. Um, but I think it's actually the first time that all four of us have actually been involved, though, which is which is fantastic. Yeah, it's it's incredibly exciting. Now, Holocene, uh, I guess, is made up of uh, Duncan Hamilton, uh, who was ex the squad, correct? We, we were both ex the squad, actually. Yeah. See, Joe, you've had this long and varied career. He, he was in it longer than I was, but yeah, I, I came in as a blow-in when a um, guitarist moved to Sydney because I was sharing a house with Duncan at the time. I see. Now and tell me about tell me about the squad. Oh, they were a mod band, of and course. they were fantastic. Um, fastest music I've ever played in my life. <laughs> it was so fast. Um, a couple of originals in there. Um, the band was fronted by the enigmatic Poz. Yes. You, um, you can actually see in one of the film clips that Holocene ended up doing, Guitar Barella. Yep, yep. Um, yeah, Squad played not often enough. We got together for a couple of reunion gigs, oh, yeah, probably 20 years ago as well. Um, just heaps of fun, one of the most fun bands I've ever played in. Uh, Julian Matthews, actually, from The Stems, played uh, bass with us for a little while too. Um, and he and I would swap um, bass and guitar for a couple of songs but yeah um it was the first band I played in in Melbourne because wow. I because I was in Geelong before then and I played in you know a couple of bands down there uh which um probably the best known one was Love Like Anthrax <laughs> <laughs> what a great name named That's after a Gang of Four song yeah yeah we used to play the bar club a lot but yeah um I kind of didn't really get playing again until i was sharing a house with Duncan and he was talking about the band needing a guitarist and was I interested? It's like, oh, okay, sounds like fun. <laughs> yeah, it was a hoot. So did the squad break up or did the squad just naturally finish? Yeah, just naturally sort of finished, I think. Yeah. And at what point do you join Ripe? Uh, the guys from Ripe, or Mark, certainly and maybe Pete as well they came along to a squad gig right and at the tote and asked me if I wanted to play bass with them and I said well I haven't played bass before <laughs> and they said that's all right you play guitar you'll be fine and it was literally that that simple I went along they gave me a couple of songs to learn uh, I borrowed a mate's bass and learnt them went to a rehearsal I think at the old stable sounds um and yeah and got the gig and that was that was great it was really fantastic experience working with those guys um yeah uh it wasn't very long you know it was probably not even a year and um and then yeah Kerry slung me a, a cassette of her songs now this is Kerry from she was uh one time Sunset Strip uh, whose whose output was very 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 short. Well, I say short limits, quite quite small. And um, she was also, I believe, a one time member of Auto Hate. Correct, correct. Yes, she was. Yep. Um, and she was also in a band called Ku Klux Frankenstein, from memory. <laughs> of course, she did all this when she was about three years old. Of course. <clears throat> yeah. But, uh, um, yeah. Kerry um, got in touch with with me one day. I'd met her because Auto Hayes and Rife were contemporaries and we used to know each other quite well. Um, and, yeah, she gave me this demo tape of songs and it, um, it had the name Universal Beam on it. And I can't even remember what songs are on it now. Um, there's about four songs, but I just thought, these are really bloody good. And, and so I said to her, yeah, I'm, I'm keen to do something. So the next time we got together, she brought along Mick and I brought along Duncan. Oh. And it, it was, it came together really easily. Yeah. Bring a friend yeah. along to rehearsal. <laughs> yeah, pretty much. Yeah. <laughs> and um, 
Mick had, uh, sorry, was it, sorry. Yeah, Mick had come from the beekeepers, which who yeah, I don't he know was a, a lot about. Guy. Yeah, right. Did you know much about the bee beekeepers? Not, not a jot. Okay. Not, not right. a thing, yeah. And Mick had only, I think, fairly recently moved to Melbourne too. You come together, it works. Uh, at what point do you choose the name Holocene? Again, this was um, Kerry's idea. Uh, we were, after a jam one night at a rehearsal room, we, as was our fairly early on habit, went back to Zorba's Suvlarkies on, Suvlarkies on um, Bridge Road in Richmond and, um, yeah, had coffees and spanakopita and uh, saganaki <laughs> and talked about band names and Kerry had a, a list there of names and Holocene was on there. And yeah, there wasn't, again, there wasn't really any argument. We just all went, yeah, I like the sound of that. <laughs> um, that's the thing about the, the whole band. Its inception was just really seamless. We, everyone got along from the get go. The music just worked from the get go. There weren't any major arguments about anything. We had very similar visions. Um, and luckily two really strong songwriters in Kerry and Mick. So I remember once Holocene formed, I do remember seeing you at the Evelyn Hunter's Tote, I'm sure, on that on that circuit anyway, the Brunswick yeah. Street circuit. But I think what I remember most is this insane and intense bidding war at the time because that's what was going on in Australian music. Uh, you know, anyone worth their salt was being chased. And the A&R men used to take residents at the bars with their big fat checkbook in their pocket. Yeah. Uh, what do you remember about that? Okay, like from memory, um, we didn't get like, you know, the the universals or, you know, the really big ones coming after us, but we did have um, three, I guess, uh, smaller ones, but the biggest amongst them was Shock, yeah. Um, and, yeah, Dave Williams from Shock was very, very, very keen and... I guess, yeah, we liked what he was offering us. Uh, we loved his vision for us. Um, and yeah, he, he just loved the songs and we liked his taste in music too. So we thought, okay, well, he likes us. And we, we liked what Shock was doing at the time too. Mm. So yeah, look, you know, maybe we should have been more strategic and waited and waited. And, but, you know, I guess we were excited, you know, mm. and we just wanted to, get our music out there as quickly as we could. You know, it was, um, what year was it? 92, 93. And we just, yeah, we just wanted to get releases out. So it's like, yeah, let's do it. <laughs> uh, so Pop Astronauts is released. That's the first yeah. taster of uh, Holocene. I remember it well. I used to play it. I think I was, that was when I was coincided with my Triple R gig, actually. So I do yeah. remember that. Yeah, that went really well for us. Um, because also at the time, um, back in the day when EG, the EG section in the age was like the Friday Bible, um, a mate of mine who I used to work with in a pub, um, he was by then a journalist at the age and he was doing like singles reviews and I slung him a copy of Pop Astronauts. So I said, oh, you reckon you could give us a Guernsey in, in EG? And he's like, yeah, sure. Yeah, I really like it. So he wrote us up. and. The following night was our launch at the Evelyn. And, um, yeah, we sold it out and then some. We actually broke the house record that night for what, whatever it was at the time at the Evelyn. It was a huge, huge night. And, yeah, it was just it was living the dream. Living the dream. Uh, what, other, what other highlight moments do you remember from, from that whole period? I, I will have a look at Guitar Barella in just a second. Um, and I do remember the launch for that. I mean, there was a real theme to your, your output. There was either space or kind of, I, I, I don't know, I want to say, yeah, that, that whole Barbarella slash space yeah. feeling. Yeah, I, I guess that's Kerry's, like, you know, take on pop culture and what, you know, stuck with her as a kid, you know, like, you know, watching shows like, you know, Lost in Space and, and movies like Barbarella. Um, and I guess, you know, the, our name itself was all, was all about a time as well. Yeah, we're very much about time and, and space. Um, and 
Mick being a graphic designer, he really sort of tied everything together beautifully visually. Like, um, and it was quite intuitive the way he did it too. That every everything we did visually, you could tell it was us. You know, whether it was a CD cover or a poster, um, a logo. Um, and again, we were really lucky in that way too, because at that time, I don't think a lot of bands were thinking that way. And certainly I think of the venue like the Continental Cafe, they were the only venue that was thinking that way too, thinking about branding like that and with a sense of continuity with everything they did. Um, so, yeah, I probably went off on a tangent there. I don't know. No. <laughs> but, no. Yes, but uh, yes, Pop Astronauts had a beautiful um, galactic cover art. Yeah. cover artwork um and yeah I think that symbolism we just kind of really sort of bought into as well it really fueled us uh you did break the house record at the Evelyn I, I was there I remember it being rammed um and I, I also remember the vocal harmonies of you and Kerry and I think that really stood out at the time yeah, there right. wasn't a lot of indie rock bands doing great female harmonies yes of course we had the clouds and uh, yeah. up in Sydney but I couldn't remember anybody in Melbourne really running with that as much as you did yeah I guess at the time yeah there wasn't a lot of um strong harmony work going around mm. but again that came back to our influence as well and you know Kerry also being a big fan of you know bands like um the fifth dimension which had beautiful beautiful um evocative dreamy harmonies and the fact that you know we all you know grew up with that music too you know pop music um we're all pop fans mm. it's funny you mentioned the clouds because back then we used to get paired with them a lot to the supports you know them and the killjoys yeah right uh, sorry not sorry not the killjoys falling joys falling sorry joys. anna <laughs> <laughs> um yeah anything and the hummingbirds yeah, right. Yeah, of yeah. course. Any, any, anything, anyone with female in front, basically. Because, yeah, because back then we were still kind of a novelty, which was really weird, you know. You, you look at the scene now and it's, you know, oh. it's almost gender blind. You yeah. Know? It, you don't say, oh, there's that female guitarist. It's just there's that guitarist. You mm. know, it's, mm. it's so different now. Um, yeah, but back then, you know, we'd go, Kerry and I, there was a show we did in Perth on a New Year's Eve and, um, this is Mick's old stomping ground. So we had mates of his helping us, you know, loaning us gear and helping us load in and stuff. And we got to this door of this venue and this woman behind the counter um, points to the two guys help carrying a couple of our cases going, okay, you, you, yeah, you guys are fine, but sorry, you girls are going to have to pay. Excuse me? Yeah, excuse me. <laughs> it was bizarre. It was really bizarre. And um, later that night, the same venue, I'm setting up my gear and this woman who was working behind the bar or something comes up to me and goes, oh, how'd you get that gig? And it's like, it's my gear. It was, yeah, thank That's God insane. things have changed. Yeah, it's, it's, it's really insane. But the thing that stuck with me was that it came from women. Yeah. At that, at that time, which was quite disappointing, you know. Yeah. Thank God things have changed. Thank God things have changed. Hmm. Let's talk about Guitar Barella. You mentioned the squad before, the band yeah. that you were in with Poz as lead singer. Poz is now drafted to be the, I guess, star of the clip, apart from your good yeah, selves, of course. Happen, but yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and, um, and you call on your posse of mates uh, to come and dance in it. And uh, I just happened to heed the call because that's what I was like then. It's like video clip filming, <laughs> I am there. I wasn't going to out you unless you did, but yes. Oh, look, and what I, a fine job you did. Oh, look, my silhouette can be seen for miles. Um, <laughs> should, we, should we remind ourselves of Guitar Barella? Oh, go on. It was one of the most fun days we ever had. <laughs>
what a blast from the park. I know, that was so much fun. And um, one of Carrie's friends, um, Kitty, she worked um, in wardrobe. She was doing wardrobe at the time for that show called Funky Squad. You remember that show that, that all I the d -gen people did? I do remember Funky and Squad. And so she brought along all these amazing clothes for people to wear. Mind you, a lot of people BYO'd anyway. Some people had some fantastic gear anyway. Yeah. yeah. And we just um, basically fed and watered everyone, well, applied them with alcohol, and then they all went fully sick. It was great. <laughs> what, what else do you remember when you see that video? Um, uh, what else do I remember? God, what, what? Um, it, was in, it was in a warehouse just off um, Brunswick Street. We all had to go upstairs to it, just this warehouse space that Mark Bacardis had hired out for the day. Um, Mark has also done quite a bit of stuff with the Foves too and still continues to do. Um, he's a great guy. Um, and, yeah, he was a big champion of ours early on, which was great, and is still a friend. Um, but what else I remember about that day is all the costume changes, um, getting our hair and makeup done. Um, my enduring memory is just fun. It was just so much fun. Um, oh, and getting to um, pose with my mate Evan's um, Vox guitar. That was pretty cool. <laughs> I might to give it back. <laughs> <coughs> Pardon me. Um, yeah, I, I, I remember I danced a lot that day. Danced a lot. Um, danced up a storm. And the thing is, you don't look any different. What's up with that? You got a oh, painting thanks. in your bloody attic with a blanket over it or something. It's actually a Duna cover, Joe, but it's all right. We'll. Uh, we'll... Okay. Um, and then, uh, of course, there's flying. Now, was that the next single after Guitar Barella, or was, have I missed something along the way? Um, we did three singles and then an album. Uh, God, I should remember this stuff, shouldn't I? Mm. Yeah, Pop Astronauts, Guitar Barella, and Flying. Yeah, right. I think Flying might have been the third one. Yeah, right. Um, and, and I actually didn't remember this single, so it's good to revisit it. Yeah, again, Kerry, she suggested it. It's actually an old Badfinger song. Yeah, now um, Badfinger, I remember interviewing you back in round 94 and you guys talking about Badfinger in that Triple R interview. Yeah, right. My memory, my mem you guys had really, yeah, you were all real big Badfinger um, fans. Oh, those harmonies, you know, just one of the best. And, um, yeah, sadly a band that didn't reach their... Um, Full potential due to um you know a couple of the members dying but yeah they were incredible incredible band um george harrison uh was a real sort of um well george actually george harrison and paul mccartney both were very um influential for that band you know produced them did you know george does the lead guitar breaking day after day um but yeah again it was all about the harmonies and the pop sensibilities and Kerry suggested this song and yeah we gave it a go and it sounded all right you know it wasn't it's quite different from the original but Barella 
film clip too. Oh, really? Yeah, yeah. I think it's Carrie's. I don't know. <laughs> yeah, and Mark Hartley, um, he directed and filmed that for us. And he he and Mark Bakaitis are both 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 um great mates. Um, Mark Hartley actually helped Mark Bakaitis with the guitar gorilla shoot on the day too. But Mark Hartley got us all to like chew bubble gum and to you know or, you know blow bubbles. And unfortunately, Duncan he was given I think blue bubble gum and it just turned his mouth completely blue, which is why his mouth is closed completely for the clip. Got it. Got <laughs> it. it Violent by regard just... special. Yeah. <laughs> it's yeah, but that was again just done in a day. It, a lot of got that yeah, quality guess, about it. That backdrop, that blue backdrop that was so nineties, and the just the the cinematography that we yeah. don't see now. Yeah, again, that was just done in a rehearsal room. I, I think it, yeah, stable sound or somewhere like that, somewhere where we used to rehearse. Yeah, um, and yeah, and done quickly as was. A lot of everything we did <laughs> in keeping with the space theme i think yeah, yeah 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 do a clip in a day another clip in a day record an album in a week yeah uh so you released the one record the one album the one yep. holocene album uh which comes out through shock um yeah. which is very hard to find these days that that record you can't find it in two dollar bins i'll take that as a win <laughs> Uh, it was called Spur, correct? Yeah. Um, what? Uh, tell me about the record. Well, um, the name came from the middle name of our um, glorious producer uh, of that record, who was Bob Weston. Spur was his mid well, is his middle name. Um, I can't recall who suggested Bob to us as a producer, but um, we know that he had just not long finished working on In Utero. With wow. um Steve Albini, crazy. Um, yeah, Bob was is um Steve's, and probably still is his studio engineer at Chicago uh, Chicago Mastering, I think it's called. Mm. Um, yeah. So that was, I think, yeah, early '94, and we had a couple of phone conversations with, with um Bob and Steve while we were trying to get onto Bob. Um, and then he arrived. And it was a really strange time actually because. Yeah, he worked on in utero, and so obviously knew Nirvana. And from the time Bob got on the plane in the states to when he landed in Australia, um, Kurt Cobain had passed away. Oh my goodness! Yeah, so it was really, really strange. Yeah, greeting him at the airport, and and I think he just got the news um, like just moments before we we saw him. So it was a pretty strange first day, but. Um, a sad first day, yeah. but he was just incredibly, incredibly professional. Um, just like, let's just get down to it. I mean, because we only had a week to record and mix wow. this album at Sing Sing. Um, Bob stayed on my couch for the week in Richmond. So it was like a three-minute drive from the studio, which was great. Um, and he was just amazing. He was so great to work with. And I think he was brought in because... Uh, we didn't want to be overproduced. We wanted to be raw and visceral, you know, without, you know, making it sound completely lo-fi, like, um, you know, like a, a Sebado recording or something. Like We wanted it to be um, present and not overproduced. And uh, to my mind, Bob achieved that, you know. Um, we kept a lot of the basic guide tracks that we put down. We did bugger all over dubs, you know maybe one or two here or there, but pretty much that was us on the record. No, no bells or whistles and strings and mirrors. It was, it was smoke and mirrors, I should say, mixing my metaphors here. <laughs> um, it was a very honest record. And I think a really strong record, you know, I think every, every song on it's terrific and still stands up. Yeah. Yeah. And so that comes out in 1995, 12 tracks. Uh, and as you said, the three singles are coming oh, out. 94, yeah, end of 94. End of 94. Yeah. Four. Okay, yep. Uh, and and then the did I imagine you, you toured that as well around the country? Yep, yep. Up and down the east coast <laughs> in a Tarago more times than I, I could remember. But, you know, and across to Perth a couple of times, across to Adelaide a couple of times. Um, got on some major supports, which was good. You know, we did a Throwing Muses support with the Foves. 
um, a Frank Black one with custard. That was cool. Wow. Um, and yeah, and you know, back in that the day, because if you didn't get Triple J airplay, you know, you pretty much weren't known anywhere mm. else. Um, so what we tended to do was make all our money in Melbourne playing gigs, then go up to Sydney and Brisbane and just <laughs> lose the lot and come back, you know. Why, now, why, don't, why don't you think uh, Triple J embraced you? Um, I don't know, maybe because we weren't produced enough. I don't know. Don't know. Couldn't tell you. Mm. And you mentioned the Foves. Why? <laughs> yeah. Why? Uh, you mentioned the Foves. At one point, uh, didn't Adam Nui from the Foves drum with you? Yeah, he did a couple of gigs with us. Um, yeah, one or two. Because um, it was about six months, a year after we released um, Spur. Yeah, Mick and Duncan um, left the band, which was, you know, it was it was a real shame. And was, um, was that down for any to any reason? Well, look, I'm probably not revealing any state secrets here, but Duncan and I did go out. Ah. Oh. After the band started. <laughs> and um, yes, I should have heeded uh, Kerry's advice. Don't screw the crew. Ah. But no, no, we, well, you know, we, we fell in love. So, and we lasted, you know, a couple of years. And unfortunately, yeah, when our relationship faltered, it was just impossible to keep the band going. Unfortunately, it's just that um, age-old story. Oh, the age-old story, eh? eh? Yeah. And um, I guess, yeah, Mick, I think it had, he was just starting to get a bit tired of it himself. Um, so, yeah, they, they left um, and we got John Freeman Baxter in on guitar and he was fantastic. Um, he had come from, what was his old band called? Sorry, John. Sorry, John. Um, I can't recall. Um, but he's he was gone in a, on he was in a few. He was in a yeah. few. Yeah. I remember um, Five Mile something. Yeah. yeah, that's the one. And that's quite a recent one. And, again, an another great rock pop band. Um, and Kerry has uh, actually helped out on a couple of recordings of theirs too. Excellent. Doing harmonies. And I think maybe doing some co-writing. Yeah. Excellent. But yeah, um, sorry, that's a very circuitous way of saying yes, Adam knew he did drum with us for a couple of <laughs> gigs um, because, yeah, we just had real trouble hanging on to a drummer. Wow. And I don't know why. Um, yeah, we tried about three different people. Um, John brought in this guy called Jeff Pennington, who we did some other recording with, and he was really good. But I think he had a, he just had a new baby and just too many commitments. So, yeah, look, unfortunately, it was in the end, I just got sick of it. And right. I just got really frustrated with us not being able to, um, yeah, hang on to a drum. And I just said, I think I've had enough of this, which, right. you know, I how, probably should have been more patient. How long after that debut album did that happen where you went, I'm done? Oh, probably a year, year and a half. Right, right. Maybe two years. Yeah. It's all a blur. Wow, because it, it does, I mean, Holocene were, you know, in the scheme of things, you you were only operating. Yeah, it does seem like not for very long when you when compared to some of the no. other bands of the decade. No, and it's it's funny when you look back and, you know, like um, Even was a contemporary of ours and so was the Foves and mm. they're about the only two who are left who have actually remained ongoing concerns. But, yeah, there was a lot of us that kind of really sort of um, burnt bright and... Um, and faded quite quickly, you know, at that time. Don't so, know why. So what did you go on to do? Um, <laughs> Jeff Jenkins, uh, he wrote a story about this, about this band. Uh, when he, we first did an interview with him, he said, what do old rockers do when they stop playing rock and roll? They go and play in alt country bands. And that's what I did. <laughs> 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 I played in this band called Ride 'em Cowboy. Um, who I still occasionally play with, actually. Um, I moved down to the Mornington Peninsula in 97 and a couple of childhood friends of mine had this band. Um, and I said, I'll oh, come play our housewarming. And so they did. And they were a three-piece. It was um, Apple on bass and Pete on guitar and Trace on drums. And I just thought they were so great. 
uh, but I said to them, but you need a rhythm guitarist. I think I can help. <laughs> so I basically <laughs> invited myself into the band. Yay. And, um, yeah, we, we played for, yeah, um, got another, yeah, 10 years or so gigging, mainly just sort of down there, you know, nothing super serious. And we still occasionally gig now. Unfortunately, our bass player passed away about 12 years ago. Um, so we just sort of occasionally get together now. So that's what I did. Um, and did Carrie keep making music? Yes. Um, because you mentioned another band as such. Oh, okay. And, and, and Mick certainly did as well. Um, yeah, right. Yeah, he gets together quite regularly with his old Perth crew because pretty much all of them ended up moving over here. <laughs> and so, yeah, he had a band called Bell Tower Letdown. Um, and he did something with... Uh, Dan O'Halloran, yeah, Dan O'Halloran, um, Phil Nat, Phil Nat, who also played for a time in Ammonia, mm. um, and a drummer called Chirps. Yeah, and they still all play together. And Nick Tweedy, he gets together with them a lot in the, you know, dad bands. Sure. <laughs> but, yeah, Mick has four kids now, so he's... um. Wow. And his, one of his sons actually now has a band too called The Noise. Oh, fantastic. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, uh, so, which, which is great, yeah. So I have to ask, how's it been going reconnecting with the old Holocene original members for these for this Sound As Ever show and I guess the punters' little yeah. Uh, show well, yeah. you're doing? How, how's that been? It's been amazing. It's been great. Yeah, we um, so, yeah, we started to get together again last year um, for the Punters Club reunion show that got Kyle Bosch by, you know, what, last year. And we did about, yeah, three or four rehearsals for that and it was just... It was great. It was. It felt like not a lot of time had passed at all, really. Um, I mean, for the Punders Club show, we're only rehearsing a couple of songs, but while we're at it, we're going, oh, let's play this one for old times and let's see what we remember of this one. And it's quite amazing how much muscle memory you retain, I think. Yeah. Um, you know, we rehearsed a bit individually before we all met up again. Um and it yeah, it sounded really, really good. And again, now now that we're rehearsing for this show with um Ammonia and Mola, which we're super excited about because we love both of them, um, it's been quite astonishing how I it, I guess it always comes easy with us. It always has, you know, it did back then and it has again now. You know, we're all, you know, 20 years has passed and sort mm. of we we're all just great mates now, you know. And it's there's no complications anymore which makes it a hell of a lot easier um and yeah and it's it's funny you know you think of, there's a couple of things we've forgotten about oh so what tuning did I did th do that song in or how did I play that riff again and so there's <laughs> a little bit of homework to be done but otherwise I'd say 90 percent of it is just coming back like that wow which is yeah it's been a really pleasant and wonderful surprise yeah, I'm, I'm definitely uh, very excited to see you guys live again and just uh, relive that magical time and, and those songs. It was a really special time. You know, it was the analogue era, you know. It was the era before we, we could do this stuff, before mobile phones when you had to actually work really hard to sort of get to people in the same room at the same time. You know, um, nothing sort of came that easily back then, but in many ways it was easier too you know it, it was a different time it was a lot of fun you know back when I guess Brunswick Street was was the hub of it true so true <laughs> yeah, good times good times well Joe, thanks so much for your time it's really great to um reminisce about Holocene and as mentioned we'll um we'll see you playing live on June 3rd at Northcote Social Club can't wait come along everybody it's going to be ace <laughs> See ya. Bye.